Hey, Alex. How's it going, man? Good. I'm really excited about this because futurism.com is one of my literally favorite media sources because they cover all the cool stuff that I like. That's great. So how, I'm, I'm kind of curious. How many people in the audience have ever read futurism.com before? Okay. We got, we got a few. That's not bad. Yeah, interesting. B better than when it didn't exist, right? Yeah, I feel like <laughs> everyone does. I don't know. Okay. So what is media? Yeah, so... Um, just as an FYI, my, my plan for this talk, I'm kind of going to go off the cuff. I'm going to tell you guys, you know, my experience building this media company. Um, we launched like a little over a year ago. Before that, I had never been in media. So I came from, you know, no background at all. And now we have about 20 million monthly readers across all platforms. All right, so I can kind of give you the nitty gritty about digital media, how it works, uh, the experience for me, and kind of, you know, my opinion of what media is. And so going back to that question, um, you know, I think media is it's a vehicle for storytelling. I mean, even the word media itself is plural for, for medium, right? And that is the, the way in which we consume stories. So text, video, uh, imagery, audio, these are all different mediums for storytelling. And right now, there are certain mediums that we've gotten used to, right? We love consuming content in video form. We love reading. We love infographics. We love podcasts. Um, but I think that as you know, the definition of media continues to evolve, we'll be seeing new creative implementations of that. So what's like the point? Like why, why, what's the purpose of media? The purpose of media, great, great question. So if you go all the way back to the first medium uh, in general, right, it was the written word. And the point of the written word was to educate, to inform, to disseminate and to store information. Um, but then you fast forward to today, right, and there are so many different competing forces for your attention, it's not really good enough just to educate and to inform. You also have to entertain, right? You want to learn something while also enjoying the process of learning that thing. And, you know, one would hope that media also, uh, it hopes to inspire, right? You, you want to feel inspired by the media that, that you're consuming. You want to create media that causes an actionable change in someone's lifestyle or their opinions about something well after the fact that, you know, they've read it. I, I was going to ask, like, what, you know, what's the purpose of you guys at Futurism, but I feel like it might be sort of yeah, touched well, on. So, so I built Futurism. How many people here know Ray Kurzweil? Yeah, so I read his book, The Singularity is Near, like 10 years ago, right? And, and my mind was blown. I read this book, and I wanted to go out, and I wanted to talk to everybody about it. I wanted to say, hey, guys, like, technology is progressing so fast, and this is really important because your lives are going to be transformed. And, and nobody cared, right? N nobody wanted to, to talk to me about it. And what I ultimately learned was that there's this kind of enormous information asymmetry that exists between those that understand the exponential progress of technology and then the general public, right? And the best, the best example of this is you go on the streets of New York City, and I know because I did this, and you ask people about self-driving cars. You say, hey, you know, what do you think about self-driving cars? 50% of people that we, that we asked this question said, self-driving cars, what, what are you talking about? Cars, cars will never drive themselves, right? They don't understand that cars are already driving themselves. They're coming. They're going to transform all aspects of your life, the way you live, the way we work. And this is only one implementation of one technology. So futurism's purpose is, is really to educate, to entertain, and to inspire people around these frontier technologies. And, uh, and since launching, I mean, we launched like 15 months ago, right? We have 20 million monthly readers across all platforms. We create a lot of video content. I don't know if you guys have seen that on Facebook. Um, kind of one minute long, exciting highlights of, of a certain technology. Last month, we had over 100 million video views. Right, so, so we're growing fast, and people want to be inspired. And, and we feel like we sit at the intersection of where kind of science fiction meets reality in that regard. I dig that. So, like, the, the line between a brand, like, between brands and media is becoming blurred as, like, brands pay to create media, and there's more sponsored content and native advertising. What's, like, going to happen with that? Totally. So it's always safe to assume if you're not paying to consume content, you are the product that is being sold, right, all the time. And that, that is the way that it's always going to be. And until you start paying for content, you're always going to be the product that's being sold. You're always going to be advertised against. And if you look at kind of the, the origins of digital media, right, they monetize via display ads, only display ads. And the amount of money you get from display ads is based on the page views. So then all of a sudden you have publishers all focused on optimizing one thing, which is page views. Everybody's making clickbait titles, the quality of content goes down, everything kind of sucks. And then the value of display ads go down because there are so many page views that are happening all the time. And then all these publishers go, they go, okay, how, how else can I monetize, right? And publishers in general only know one thing. They only have one 
customer, and that's brands. So they say, how else can I get brands to pay me to create content? And that, you know, brands naturally, they want to blur the lines, right? They, don't, they want to create sponsored content, but they don't want you to know it's sponsored. But as a, as a, as a publisher, you're kind of, you're handicapped, right? You, you only know one source of, of revenue, and that's generally brands. So I think it's, it's going to continue to be blurred. And I think that you know, there is like an escape route, and that escape route is these publishers discovering some other way to monetize. And so that could be via like attaching a store to your publication, right? You can monetize by selling goods. Uh, you could have like some kind of fund-backed media company where you're making investments in some of the, the companies that you profile, something like that. Um, and then there's like the most promising thing, in, in my opinion, which is micropayments, right? So I think people ultimately should be paying for content. And, and if you look at something like YouTube, I don't know, if anyone here knows, but you know, every time you watch a YouTube ad, the YouTube creator gets paid pretty much one-tenth of one penny. So, so I'm kind of curious, you know, how many people here would pay more than one-tenth of one penny to not see the ad on a YouTube video? Would you pay more than one-tenth of a penny? I'm assuming a lot of people would, right? And so the, the reason why this doesn't exist is like it's an infrastructure question. Micropayments are hard. Uh, they're not easy to transact. The transaction cost is oftentimes too high. And so there are some promising technologies there to mitigate that, like the blockchain, which you know, we can get into a little bit more later. Um, but on the brand side, I see that continuing until there's a, bit, a, bigger, a better solution. Yeah, it becomes weird, right? Because like, if brands are just you know, buying content, then like... Totally. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's a general problem with media right now, right? Is all publishers, like the big secret is all, no publisher knows what they're doing. Like it is the wild west out there. Everybody's struggling to monetize. And you see a lot of these older companies that have high overhead, like they have no choice but to try to get as many page views as possible because they have to maintain a certain amount of revenue. And it's, I mean, it's a, it's a crazy scene out there, man. It's crazy. Yeah. So this next question I have is like, what are the biggest threats to, to success of media? But like, I actually want to switch it a little bit. Yeah. Like what is, this, what is success for media? Like. That's a great question. Um, so I think success for media is being able to influence the perception about a certain topic, right? And, and my go-to example for this, and, and one of the reasons why I think the, the ability to have a media company is so powerful is there's this technology called CRISPR. How many people here know what, what CRISPR is? Okay, so, so we got a few, right? So CRISPR is kind of a gene editing tool. It allows you to kind of literally cut and paste from the genome. And this, this discovery was made maybe four or five years ago, and it never really hit the mainstream until about 18 months ago when MIT Tech Review, they ran one article about it. And that article kind of conveyed it in a negative light, right? But everybody read this article. There was just one article, and all other articles stemmed from this single one. So some technology that could have such a profoundly positive impact was negatively perceived by pretty much everyone because of one media, one piece. And then you see regulators, right? Regulators don't know what CRISPR is. They, they don't understand it. All they know is that the public thinks it's bad. So then they regulate it. They, out, they try to outlaw it. And then you, you see kind of this like ripple down effect of um, negative coverage of media. So I think the most, the most promising way to measure success of media is by the ability to influence public perception. Maybe we should outlaw like all media that isn't generated by the creator, him or herself. Possibly. I mean, that, that's <laughs> radical. Maybe. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Um, so what's media going to look like in like five or ten years? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. So I think media right now is, is at a very bad place. Um, I think that publishers rely on display ads to monetize, and 50% of millennials use ad blocker, right? They're not monetizing there. Um, all advertisers say mobile, mobile ads are the future. 60% of mobile ad clicks are accidental, right? They're due to fat thumbs. It's literally, they're accident. it's an accident. So, so I think like the future of, of media, the big question is how do you monetize content? Is there going to be a better solution than display ads or than sponsored ads? Perhaps, but perhaps not. And, and everybody says that you know, the future of media is going to be virtual reality, augmented reality, and that's great, and there, there are some great experiences, but the reality is that unless the consumers are paying for these experiences in some way or another, they're never going to be cost effective, right? Like, you're never going to be able to have this interactive media experience at scale unless you're paying for it, or unless somebody's paying for it, and if somebody else is paying for it, then again, you're the product, right? You're being sold something. So I think these are all kind of important things to weigh. Like, I don't... I think virtual reality is very promising. I think immersive storytelling is certainly the future. I don't think anyone's figured it out yet. And I think that you know, right now it's going to be limited to the select few that have a headset. Uh, how many people here have a virtual reality headset? One, two, uh, two right? So, so it's not a scale yet. Um, five years, maybe 10 years, sure. But, but I think that the big question is how to monetize. 
So like which formats, I mean, you mentioned VR, but like, you know, if it's not a Facebook instant play video, it doesn't exist to me. Yes. So like which formats are gonna just like rule the world in, in the future? Yeah, so, so I think, you know, Cisco came out with this big report that said that 80% of all content consumed on the internet will be in video form in the next five years. So video is certainly king, Facebook's betting on video. Facebook has all the sway in the publishing world right now, right? There's no other channel as powerful as Facebook when it comes to distributing content. Like Snapchat is getting up there, but Facebook, Facebook is king. And, and the reality is Facebook has so much influence that they can create the future of media. And they're saying it's video. And so if they say it's video, it's, it's gonna be video. But I think that it will continue to trend towards full immersion. So you know, augmented reality, virtual reality, in some regard, it will get there. I don't think it's gonna get there anytime soon though. So this next question I like. Yeah. So Ray Kurzweil, he mentioned uh, like earlier, I don't know if that many people raised their hands, like he wrote a book called The Singularity, and like, you know, Ray, he's like the chief futurist for Google, and his whole thing is that we're gonna get to this point in like 2045-ish, called The Singularity, where like technology and like human slash human biology intersect, and we live forever, et cetera. Um, so like how would a future that includes wearables and implants that like connect, you know, people to content and to each other and to the internet, how would that transform media? Yeah, totally. So, so I think in general, when people consume media, uh, they consume a lot of media, and then in hindsight, they think that 10% of the media they consumed was worth consuming again. Like, you know, if they knew what it was gonna be like, they probably wouldn't have done it. And, and I think that that is a very inefficient process, right? So I think as these technologies continue to become more integrated into our lives, wearables, implantables, media will become more customized. Right? You're gonna be delivered media when you want it, when you need it. Uh, as opposed to kind of trying to consume, trying to find what you're looking for in like this long tail. Um, so, so I would say that that's my big opinion. I mean, there are technologies like Magic Leap. I'm sure the majority of people have heard of Magic Leap, right? Where they project display directly onto your retina, um, and like it makes the virtual world indistinguishable from the actual world, right? I mean, that is what they do. Is like for the tests, and they're very secretive about this. But what they do is they'll bring you into a dark room. They will like turn on the lights, and you have to try to figure out what is real and what isn't real. And most people can't figure out what is and isn't real. So I think that as we continue to head in that direction, media will become full immersion, more customized, uh, and more direct to consumer. Yeah, so we had Neil Harbison here earlier, like yes. you know, the cyborg, and he you know, has this implant that actually connects him to Wi-Fi and allows, he has five friends that he's like given permission to send him like a color from the continent that they're on. That's awesome. So he can experience like the sunset, and yeah, it's really crazy. That's really cool. Um, talk about custom content. Yeah. Um, what, so like kind of a little different. So like, you know, you, all you do is think about the future and cover future stuff. Like yeah. which part of the future unrelated to media are you just super mm. freaking stoked about? That's a good question. It's a very good question. Um, so I'm pretty big into the blockchain. I don't know any, if anyone else here is into the blockchain. You know, the idea of a distributed ledger, um, I think that can transform everything, including media. I think blockchain is the best possible way to implement um, microtransactions on the web. And so I think if microtransactions can occur, the entire media landscape will, will change. So, so blockchain, media, big impact. Um, overarching, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty big into CRISPR. You know, the idea of genetic engineering, being able to identify and remove uh, certain, I would say, dangerous sequences um, is very, very powerful. I don't think enough people are, they understand the, the potential ramifications of this. Uh, and I think it's going to be really interesting. I mean, China's been, right, so, and so in the U.S. in general, it's been illegal to experiment on human embryos using CRISPR uh, because of this whole story that I mentioned, right? So, so that was the regulatory landscape. China said, oh, no, you know, we're going ahead. Like, we see the potential of this. And they did. And they've been doing that. So for the past year, they've been doing incredible research into this space. And you, like, you know, I kind of frame it as, like, this genetics arms race where China is doing all this incredible research in, the, in these, these fields. And then the, Europe and the U.S., we've kind of been very hesitant. But then you saw Europe come out and say, oh, man, like, you know, we're falling behind. Like, we got to catch up here. And so then they deregulated the entire process. Now you can uh, experiment on human, on human embryos using CRISPR in Europe. And now, in certain cases, it's legal in the U.S., Right, so you kind of see this race to be able to genetically modify humans because the potential economic impact of that is enormous. Yeah, CRISPR, it's like, it's essentially like drag and drop genetics, totally. which is insane. Um, what do you think about space? Ah, uh, so what do I think about space? <laughs> Should we go? Yeah, so I mean, I would love to get to space like in my lifetime, without, without a doubt. Um, I think that the privatization of space is a great thing. I think that Elon Musk is doing great work. Um, I think that 
the idea of inhabiting Mars by 2025. I think that's his goal. He always like makes it earlier. I, mean, I think that's incredibly ambitious, uh, but I think it's awesome, right? I mean, how many people here would love to go to space if they had the opportunity? There we go. And, wow, and, and I that's a market, that. right? That, that's a market. Like there, there's an enormous market for that. And then there are things like asteroid mining, which, which itself is, is enormous, right? Like the first private company just got permission to land on the moon, right? To, to mine for, for minerals. Um, and so I think there's a lot of exciting stuff happening there. I mean, I think it's, it's going to take a while before we see anything mind blowing, like getting to Mars, but, uh, but it's really exciting. Sick. Awesome. You guys have any questions? Bam. Uh, so you talked about like the genetics Yeah. Yeah. Totally, man. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely an arms race for, for AI companies, right? Apple just bought another company yesterday or like two days ago for $200 million. Uh, if you can build an AI company right now, like somebody will buy it for a lot of money. So it's a, it's a great space. I mean, there's tons of great work going on in AI. Uh, I think it's really interesting where you see the, the I guess, the, the integration of AI in robotics. So this company, Hanson Robotics, out of Hong Kong, they create super lifelike robots that are like unbelievably lifelike. They were on the Charlie Rose show, I think, like two years ago, and now you can imagine, you know, implanting the the AI that is in like the now robot into this human-like being. And I think there's so much potential there. And I think short term, we're going to see the integration of basic AI into these human-like robots, which will be exciting enough. Um, and then, you know, long term, there's potential for AGI and, and all that good stuff. The future is bright. All right, before we give a huge clap, one more question. That guy had it high up. Go ahead, man. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a great question. Um, so. We've like crunched the numbers on this a lot, and I think bringing e-commerce onto the site is a lot more profitable. Um, affiliate linking can be good if you're doing it at mass, mass scale. You know, like you assume that you get five percent of the transaction. Uh, you got to do a lot of transactions. You got to sell a lot of products, and I think that with affiliate linking too, you're kind of blurring the lines between sponsored content and like you know true journalism, which is dangerous. Uh, but for us, right, like we've. I think as a publisher, the best thing you can do right now is find creative ways to monetize. Our creative way that we found, we license our content to governments. Right? So we work closely with the government of the UAE. We have an Arabic science publication as well that's blowing up. I mean, it, they, they love it there. And we partner with the government to bring it there. We, we hired a team. Um, our Arabic Facebook page is like 4 million followers, more than our English page. Right? So we partnered with them. We found this creative outlet to like, license our content and to monetize without having to put display ads. So if you go to our site, we, we have no display ads at all right now. We, we only monetize via these like, licensing and sponsored content deals. Dope. All right, man. I'm a softy. That's a great question. I think the echo chamber already exists. I mean, I don't know if anyone else here is like shocked by this whole Trump thing, right? But but I I, I go on Facebook and all I see is like anti-Trump. And Nobody's I'm like, where, Trump, you know, yeah. where is the pro-Trump stuff? Like what's going on here? So I'm already in an echo chamber in many respects. And Facebook, it's in their best interest to keep me in an echo chamber because they want me to keep clicking on stuff. So I'll keep clicking on stuff as long as like in general, it's something that interests me. And if it's not interesting, I probably wouldn't click on it. And therefore I think I'm already in an echo chamber. So I think that pushing more towards customization wouldn't necessarily make us further or push us further into an echo chamber, but I think there has to be something uh, that has to change in general for people to get out of that. All right, dope. Uh, no more questions. We're done. Um, all right, cool. This is so cool. I love that. Thanks again, man. This um, is awesome. This, dude, this is yeah, a great huge event. Huge clap. <laughs>